I lost my voice yelling at Pat, trying to get Pat Maroon on the bus last night. <laughs> um, it was us and the Bellix, Friesman's and Bellix. Oh. oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, it was good. I'm sure Pat's shirt somewhere in the Hillsborough River. Probably. Yes, Job, yes. We're on a boat somewhere. I don't know. He went through a couple of them. Yeah, at one point he asked me to take off my shirt and give him my shirt. I was like, I don't think you're fitting in a large, buddy. <laughs> Not going to look good. Francesca at the end of the night was like, how did you lose another shirt? To grab Dave Michigan his championship shirt. Well, yesterday was a little uh, helter skelter. I hope everybody made it out okay. You guys should have a, a whole highlight video of. There you go. The Bolt Brew. Championship Vintage. Nice. Very nice. Thanks, you, Lily. Would have preferred the char grilled oysters, but what are you going to do? Oh, Joe's got the camera on. How I'm not that. I'm not that scary. So. How's your flight, Joe? Three. Uh, three thirty. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm assuming there'll be a news announced at three forty-five. <laughs> We're gonna embargo everything until then. Okay. Good news. Yeah. I don't think Allegiant has Wi-Fi, so I think I'd be out of luck. Allegiant does definitely not have Wi-Fi. Yeah. I've been on probably 50 Cedar Rapids flights. Yeah. Great, though. I love it. Big Allegiant guy, although not during COVID. Yeah. When you have the direct, op direct flight options, it helps. As well. yeah, Albany. I've done uh, Cedar Rapids and Appleton, Wisconsin. Actually, went to Traverse City direct there too from St. Pete. So, we were talking about doing Asheville, but they, they go direct to Asheville too. Yeah. I'm going to My, Asheville November 1st. Yeah, the Charlie. Like, Z. What's up, Jay? Joe, Yo, you can see my Wisconsin helmet back there. When's, the, was, when's the big game? We make another bet. Yeah, I don't know. I still owe you a song. <laughs> you still owe me a song, yeah. Whenever that ever happens. I don't know when that'll ever happen again. The karaoke, yeah. Uh... What you know after today? After today, we're trying to be quiet for a couple of days before the draft. Yeah. yeah. On Tuesday. So how's, uh, I obviously it's virtual, so you'll, I guess they'll have a Zoom with like Julian afterwards, I guess, is that, or with Al, or is that kind of the plan? Yeah. So. Is, 
the league is handling like all the big uh, zooms. So we have our setup, and then we move from there. And but there won't be a separate Julian pre-draft zoom. This is to be the one before the the draft kind of thing, right? Correct. You have any draft questions? I do now. Yeah. Yeah. He's kicking it from the TBL.com studios. Yeah. I'm kicking it from right outside your office door. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Burns, you got some sun, brother. It's probably just me like rushing to get here because I slept in until 10 and expected to get up at 7.30. So I'm probably ready from that. <laughs> Did you pick up the tab last night? What's up? Did you pick up the tab at American Social last night, Bernsey? I didn't go to American Social. I was done as soon as we got back from Raymond James. Bernsey picked up the tab for the 50 hot dogs I was asked to order. <laughs> Not really. Just kidding. <laughs> That was a day. A lot different than 04. Yeah, a lot of sun. There wasn't a parade in 04, right? They were just went around the... That was a parade. We were all in uh, cars. Okay. All right. Here we go. You guys ready? Yep. Yep. Julian, welcome. You're on. Uh, you're on mute. So I, I, a, I apologize for being late. Two, I apologize for being on mute. So <laughs> I appreciate everyone uh, bearing with me. Had a little technical difficulties here, but I think we're all good now. Everyone can hear and see me well. Yeah. Yes. Yep. All right. Who's on? Who's on? Other? I see Joe. I see Diana. Yep, we're both here. Are you the only ones? No, we got Jay's, Bernsey, and Eric's here. Oh, okay, so. good. I, okay, I see you now. We're about uh, 18 strong. All right, good turnout. I will try not to disappoint. <laughs> uh, again, appreciate everyone, uh, everyone joining us via Zoom uh, under these uh, circumstances uh, in these COVID times. Uh, I thought I might just start with a, a recap of how we got to today uh, before we get to uh, what needs to be done in the coming days. If we go all the way back to, to last off season, uh, in order to do better this year, uh, we, we decided that we had, uh, after evaluating our, our group, we, we, we kind of had three points of emphasis going into the season. We wanted to do a better job at reducing the number of quality chances against uh, and we're going to do that by protecting the slot better. Uh, we're going to do that by uh, reducing the number of minor penalties. And we're going to do that by reducing the number of turnovers. Um, by all our metrics, we did a better job of protecting the slot. Uh, with regards to minor penalties, uh, we had a rough October. And then uh, we actually did pretty good uh, November, December, when we spoke at the uh, midpoint of the year. Uh, I believe we were, uh, we'd were, we'd found our way to, to the middle of the league. Uh, we were at league average in terms of, of minor penalties. And then it, it really started to slip again. Uh, when I looked into it a little more uh, in depth, it started slipping around game 59. And even early, early on in the playoffs, uh, we were still taking too many minor penalties. So that's certainly an area where we can, we can and must do better going forward. But um, we did a better job at protecting the slot. We did a better job at reducing the number of turnovers. Uh, and all in all, we did a better job at reducing the number of quality chances against. The second point of emphasis was going to be uh, to be physically uh, a team that battles harder, just physically battle harder. And, 
again, we wanted to, in terms of what we're looking for, we're looking for uh, our team to do a better job uh, of boxing out the front of the net. Um, and by our metrics, we did. Uh, we wanted to be a harder team in puck battles. Uh, again, when we looked more in depth at our team, uh, as, a, as a group, we did a better job. Um, the addition of Barclay Goodrow and Blake Coleman, uh, Mitch Stevens and Pat Maroon, we're uh, certainly not foreign to the fact that we did a better job in, in terms of, of being harder in puck battles and winning more pack battles and being engaged in more puck, puck battles. Uh, with regards to our returning group of forwards, um, we did better as a group, um, but we can still improve. I would say half the guys did improve year to year uh, and the other group kind of stayed the same. The other area where we wanted to do better uh, still within the theme of being you know physically battling harder we wanted to have more of a net front presence uh, and we did that this year and in particular we did that during the playoffs and it paid dividends for us so um we did a better job overall reducing the number of quality chances again so we did a better job overall uh being a team that's physically harder uh, that, that battles harder physically uh, and the third area where we wanted to be better was uh we wanted to manage the game better and it was a work in progress throughout the season. Uh, I think I mentioned that at a, when we met at the mid-year point. Come playoff time, we did a we did we did a really good job, and you have to at that point. Uh, and we we're able to uh, close out games and um, protect leads. Uh, it, and even when we didn't, it wasn't necessarily because we did a bad job. Sometimes it's a bad break. Sometimes it's the other team making a great play, and you have to tip your cap to them. So. Uh, again, to, to, to summarize, going into the season, we wanted to reduce the number of quality chances against. We wanted to be a team that battles physically harder and we wanted to manage the game better. And we did that. And because we did, we were a better team. Um, if you look at, uh, you know, our goals against or our goals for we're still number one in the league. Um, our power play ended up being fifth uh, after being number one the year before. Um, it started slipping around January, if I recall, uh, and because I believe we were we were number one in January up to that point. Um, our goals against we were seventh a year ago. We're still seventh this year, uh, but we really improved after the third, the first thirty five games of the season. Uh, so uh, we were trending in the right direction again. All this is a work in progress. You're trying to build up to peaking at the right time, and that's playoff time, all the while accumulating enough points to qualify for the playoffs. Our penalty kill ended up being 13th. Ideally, you want to be in the top 10. Um, our, our numbers were a little bit skewed by the fact we had a really rough October. Uh, and then we were playing catch up from that point on. Uh, but we did a really good job from November 1 up until the trade deadline. Uh, I believe we, were, we had the number one penalty kill during that stretch. So. Um, all in all, like we had a good team and the numbers kind of support that at the trade deadline or, or following the trade deadline. Uh, the results weren't necessarily there right away. Uh, our penalty, uh, our power play was still, you know, kind of going through some 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 challenges, I guess. Uh, and those challenges that started probably again in January, uh, our penalty kills kind of slipped, which was ironic considering the type of players that. Uh, we went out and acquired um, our goals for went down a little bit. Our goals against went up. So everything was kind of trending in the wrong direction af after the trade deadline for that very small sample. And that's somewhat to be expected. Maybe you have all these new players coming in and we had, you know, three new players come in uh, at that point, which is, is, is a lot. It's more than 10% of your team. Uh, and it kind of changes everyone's role, not everyone's role, but a lot of the players role and everyone's kind of figuring out where they sit and where they where they kind of fit in all this. And uh, I guess that's probably uh, normal that we, we, we didn't necessarily see the results right away. Uh, if I, I go back to my mindset at the trade deadline and, and kind of what I was looking at, at that point, um, once again, we were a cup contender at the trade deadline. And I believed I had to try to give ourselves absolutely every chance to win the cup this year. That's what you do when you're a contender. And as opposed to last season, where I really didn't see positional upgrades, uh, they were kind of tough to imagine considering how the team was humming. Uh, again, at that deadline, we were number one on the power play, number one on the penalty kill, 
first and goals for, first and goals against. We had guys sitting out that were good players, and we had kind of a rotation of forwards and D um, coming in and out of the lineup, not because guys didn't deserve to play, but just because we had that that type of depth. This year, I thought we we could really benefit from adding some players. Uh, and, and again, in particular, I felt we could really benefit from adding two forwards that were going to be hard to play against, bring some size, bring some bring some snarl, uh, some sandpaper. Uh, they were really good defensively. We're, we're trying to improve our team defensively at that point and be harder to play against. And um, and then when Jan Ruta got hurt, then we had to also consider adding uh, another defenseman, another right shot defenseman. Um, and eventually we, we ended up, uh, we ended up, you know, signing Zach Bogosian, uh, to, to address our, our, our right shot D depth, uh, and making a couple trades, bring in Barclay Goodrow and, and Blake Coleman. Again, my mindset at that point was to be very aggressive in the pursuit of the pieces that I believe could give us a strong push forward. It wasn't just about adding depth to our team. It's it about making our team better. Uh, all the while keeping an eye on next season uh, and, and trying to make sure that we remain a competitive team year in, year out. So we're also looking at players that we could potentially add to our group that had good contracts going forward. And that made the Blake Coleman and Barkley Goodrow all the more attractive to us. 99% of the time, uh, trade decisions are guided by ensuring that we get good value. At this particular juncture, if I had passed up opportunities to give us every possible chance to win this season and we didn't win the cup, I felt like I wouldn't be able to live down the regret I would have. Um, so I aggressively pursued uh, Blake and, and Barkley. And that being said, I think we got really good value. Uh, I think uh, the, the issue is maybe perceived value versus actual value. Um, if you look at the value of, well, first of all, the acquisition of Barclay Goodrow, if you look at the acquisition cost, if you break it down, the trade was what was going to be a late first round pick for Barclay Goodrow, uh, two seasons of Barclay Goodrow at a really good cap number and a third round pick. So really the acquisition cost ends up being the difference between the probabilities that our late first round pick. Uh, the player we we're going to select with our late first round pick was actually going to turn into an NHL asset, a player that plays, you know, regularly on, on an NHL team two to four years from now. It's the difference between that and the probabilities that our third round, the player we're going to select in the third round ends up being an NHL contributor two to four years down the road. Um, and when you look at it that way and you frame it that way, I think we ended up getting great value in, in, in acquiring Barkley Goodrow. Uh, if you look at the Blake Coleman trade, again, it's the value of, of a late first round pick and a, and a good young prospect. The probabilities that that late first round pick ends up being a, uh, you know, a top nine forward like Blake Goodrow, uh, like uh, Blake Coleman is less than 50%. Um, that's why if you have a guy who is an established, proven top nine forward, they usually get traded for more than simply one late first round pick. Um, the Blake Coleman example is one, but we also traded JT Miller a year ago for a first round pick and a third round pick. Um, and not to get into what other teams have done or mentioned specifics, but if you look around the league and you look at similar players to Blake Coleman that got traded, they never go just for a late first round pick. There's always more to the trade than that uh, because you have the one that's a sure thing. Blake Coleman, he's, a, he's got an established, uh, he's got an established track record versus that late first round pick, which is, you know, less than a 50, 50 proposition two to four years down the road. So, and then I thought we got obviously good value in, in uh, signing uh, Zach Bogosian because we didn't have to give up anything. We had the cap space to bring him in. We didn't have to give up any assets. So all in all, uh, I was really happy with the value we got even before getting, you know, going on this run and, and eventually uh, having it culminate with, with a championship. Uh, so after the deadline, then the season pauses and 
I have to give credit to our players. Their commitment to winning this season, it never waned. I was continually in touch with them. They were continuously in touch with our director of sports performance, Mark Lambert, uh, and they stayed on top of their conditioning. Uh, and they also did a great job, you know, staying at home and, and limiting their risk of, of getting the COVID virus. Um, then we had an outbreak. Then we, you know, we kind of got to phase two where our facilities reopened and we had a number of cases, uh, players and staff, and the guys just stayed the course. Um, they stayed the course, they kept their eyes on the prize and they just, they just kept, they just kept at it. Um, then we went to Toronto to start the playoffs and, and hopefully defy the odds uh, because when the season starts, the odds are you're not winning the Stanley cup. Uh, and even when the playoffs start and you're down to 16 teams, the odds are, even if you're the top seed, the odds are you're not going to win the Stanley cup. And your job is to defy those odds. And, and you have to believe that you're the one team that's going to defy those odds because someone will. And there's so much to overcome. It's just so hard to win a single playoff game. We, everyone was able to witness that. Like most games were the, the margin of victory was so small, uh, let alone winning four uh, of those games to win a series. And then in the end, you have to win 16 games to win the cup. So it is a lot to overcome. And we had to beat four really good teams, uh, four times each. And then we like, any team, you have to overcome injuries. And, and some of those injuries force players to miss games. Um, some of those injuries, the players were able to fight through, but it, it still uh, was limiting to them. Uh, we had a number of overtime games this year. Uh, it's just a hard risk, hard risk run. We had the five overtime game to start the playoffs, and that took a lot out of our guys. Uh, I'm not even sure they physically recovered from that one game. Uh, and, and they've played 21 games since then and found a way to win 15 of them uh, against some really good competition. It, it, it is very, very impressive what, uh, what the players were able to do. Um, and I'm so happy for each and every one of them. Uh, over an 82-game season, uh, a little edge in talent adds up. Uh, but when you're looking at only one game or one series, it comes down to who who does enough to meet the challenge uh, for that particular game or that particular series. And it can always be either team. It's that close. And I have mentioned this at, at our rally on uh, Monday night. Like I am in awe of what our guys accomplished. I am in awe of how deep they had to dig physically and mentally in order for us to fly back to Tampa with the cup. Um, it, it was being able to witness it, you know, up close. It was, it was, uh, it, it was, it was awesome. It was awe inspiring. It was, it, it was just so incredible what they did. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to get my name, uh, engraved on the Stanley cup. And, and, uh, I was honored to be nominated for GM of the year, but that has a lot more to do with, with, the, the, the work uh, of our players, the work and the sacrifices of our players and our staff and our coaches uh, than it does with me. And, and I am uh, truly appreciative and grateful um, for everything that they've done. And, and it is not lost on me that I'm the beneficiary of, of all of their hard work and sacrifices. And, and now, as Coop says, uh, we get to walk together forever as the 2020 Stanley Cup champions. And I don't care how easy Pat Maroon makes it look, it is really hard to win a championship. And I couldn't be happier. Uh, the reality is you, you never fully control the end results. Uh, you don't have that much control, actually. Uh, nobody does when you embark on, on the path to, to a great accomplishment. You need the stars to align for you. Uh, and this year, through the effort and the sacrifices of our players and our coaches and our support staff, uh, the support and, and the resources of our owner and just enough pixie dust, we were able to win the Stanley cup. And it was, it was an incredible, incredible run and an incredible, incredible experience. And I'm so happy for, for our players and our staff uh, and our fans and for Jeff Vinnick, who's the best owner in sports. Um, our guys are such a 
like our players are such a great bunch of, of guys. I'm, I'm so happy for each and every one of them. And in particular, I'm happy for Coop, uh, our head coach, because when teams get eliminated, the, the reality is the head coach always gets a disproportionate amount of the blame. Uh, it happens every year to pretty much every every head coach who sees his team gets eliminated. Uh, so it's nice when a good guy who's a great coach um, ends up getting rewarded for all of his hard work uh, with, with a Stan, Stanley Cup ring. And uh, I'm glad that I was there to share the experience with, with Coop. So I guess that brings us to today and the off season. Uh, and winning is a hard business at this level. Uh, for us to win the cup, the players had to do a lot of hard work. Uh, and the coaching staff had to make some hard decisions. And now if we want to win another cup, it's my turn to make some hard decisions. Um, and my job, my duty is to make decisions that increase the odds of the team being successful. Um, and every decision that I'm going to be making in the next couple of days is going to be based on trying to improve the odds that we will continue to be a Stanley Cup contender year in, year out for the foreseeable future. And I believe that we have what it takes to, to, to be uh, such a team. Uh, and it's not necessarily about accumulating the most talent. Uh, it, it's about putting the best team together. Uh, you might have heard me mention in the past when we make decisions regarding player personnel, it's about the player on the ice, the person, and the contract. And the irony of my predicament is that uh, we have good players and, and they're on good contracts. Uh, if they're not on good contracts, it's because their contract is up. Uh, and I'm sure I'd be able to probably work something out with them. And with some of them, I will be able to work uh, a contract out. Um, but even though I would like to bring this whole group back together so we could try to defend our championship, and I truly, that would be my preference. If I, if I got to choose what I would want to do, it's to bring everyone back as is, and we try to defend our title. The reality is I can't do that. Uh, the, the, cap, the cap just doesn't allow that to happen. Uh, it never does for any team. There's always some turnover. And this year, the turnover is going to require that some of our players uh, that have been here for a while and, and that just helped us win a championship uh, aren't going to be returning. I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to move on from those players uh, in order to uh, absorb the cap hit increase for Andre Vasilevsky. Uh, his cap goes up six million dollars, and he's the best goalie in the world. And he just won a Stanley Cup, and I'm glad he's on our side. Uh, I need to re-sign Anthony Sorelli and Mikhail Sergachev and Eric Cernak, who are all good young players who haven't really entered their prime yet. And they're going to allow us to continue to be a good team going forward for, for many years. Uh, so they're a priority. Uh, but their salary increases, which are well-deserved, are going to eat into our cap space. And we didn't have any cap space to start with. Uh, and the cap Although if you we go back to the pre-pandemic days, we were expecting the cap to go up at least to $84 million, up from $81.5 million. Uh, the cap is stuck at 81.5 for this upcoming year, probably in my estimation for two more years after that. Um, so hard decisions are gonna have to be made and, and some players are gonna have to be uh, moved out of the organization uh, to make room for, for to kind of reallocate our cap space. Uh, and other players that are free agents that I would like to bring back, I might not be able to bring back. I won't, I just won't simply have the cap space to do that. Um, I think, I think that's all I had. I'm going to throw it out, I'm going to throw it out the questions if there are any left. We open up to questions. Um, Julian, you mentioned uh, injuries in the playoffs. Um, are there any updates you can share with us um, with a short off season? Is um, Stephen in any question to be able to start next season? Is that a concern at all? No, we fully expect him to be uh, to be ready for next season. Um, as you all know, uh, Stephen had 
uh, sports hernia surgery in uh, prior to the the pause, uh, and f- actually fully recovered from that injury and was a full participant in our phase two. Um, did a tremendous job rehabbing during the, during the pause and, and getting himself ready. Uh, but as it happens, sometimes with all injuries, but this injury in particular, uh, sometimes your body compensates and uh, it. it it eventually triggered uh, probably what we believe is a compensation injury uh, that has kind of developed into or turned out to be what we think anyway uh, related to the, this injury. I don't know all the specifics yet, to be honest, just because uh, we are we have a consult uh, coming up with a specialist next week uh, that we're setting up for Stephen. The, the whole pandemic certainly didn't help his cause because – it was hard to, you couldn't, you couldn't send him anywhere to go see specialists. Uh, if he goes out of the bubble, now he's, he's got a quarantine again. Uh, what's the trade-off? He wants to be around the team. We want him around the team. It, it certainly complicated matters. Uh, and I will know more next week. But what we expect this to be is potentially, a, potentially another injury, but we're talking about weeks of rehab, uh, not months of rehab. And we fully expect him to be ready for the start of, uh, of training camp whenever that will be. Hey, do you have a question? If you do have a question, please just uh, hit the raise hand. Function. I don't see a raise hand raise. Jay has his hand raised. Is that, uh, is that an accident, Jay? You're on mute. You're on mute, Jay. I swear this isn't my first time. <laughs> Julie, can, can you just talk about the reception that Tampa Bay had uh, yesterday when everybody was going around on, on the boats and just everything from the airport to uh, the end of the night last night at Raymond James Stadium? I didn't know what to expect. I don't think any of us inside the bubble knew what to expect. We weren't involved in uh, the planning of uh, the celebrations, and we've kind of We've been not kind of we've been secluded for 65 days. We're kind of a little bit disconnected from what's going on in the real world. Uh, and it blew whatever expectations we could have had out of the water. No one expected this kind of turnout. Uh, the parade on the water was memorable. Uh, kudos to the people that organized it. Uh, it. It was just an awesome experience. The, there are no words. The to see that many people turn out to uh, cheer and support our, our players and, and for us to get a chance to thank them uh, and show them the cup that we've all won together, uh, fans included, uh, was just a, a series of moments that none of us will ever forget. Like In your life, there is just a certain number of days that you're going to remember, that you're going to have a vivid re- memory of, uh, and, and they, they are reserved for – things that are remarkable and this whole this whole run had a number of them and this week in particular the celebration on the ice in the locker room after the game the flight back the reception when we landed uh the rally at amelie arena on on, uh tuesday night uh the parade yesterday the rally at ray raymond james that's that's a lot of memories uh and and a lot of motivation for us to do this again it was that cool. Bill Smith. Thanks for doing this. Um, I know you guys didn't just get off the plane on, on Tuesday and realize you had a cap crunch you had to deal with. You've been planning for this for a long time now. Um, as far as the familiar faces that, that probably have to go, how much of a challenge is it with some of the no trade clauses you have in those contracts of not having that kind of flexibility? And do you anticipate having to make some of those moves before the draft uh, on Tuesday? I don't have a timeline uh, and I'm still gathering a little bit of information. Um, obviously the, the, the sooner we can have all the information we need, the better, because it just potentially uh, uh, probably the, 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 a better way of, of framing this is the longer we wait, the fewer options we may have uh, because uh, other teams might have done something else and, and taken themselves out of, of the opportunity. To, to do business with us so i've already been in touch with uh with uh actually all the agents of our players uh to kind of give a little bit of a timeline 
and uh, all the players that are up, you know, whose contracts are up, uh, will start uh, connecting with uh, my uh, colleagues from around the league in the coming days. Uh, but we're still gathering some information. And eventually, all I know is by the time the 2021 season starts, we'll be cap compliant and we'll have a really competitive team. Any uh, further questions? Diana, go ahead. Joe, can you mute yourself, please? Sure. Um, Julian, what were the keys to kind of surviving the bubble? Um, everyone talked about the mental strength it took to get through this. And um, what were things you guys found that you tried that maybe worked? Maybe were there early, try early attempts that didn't work as well and you pivoted to new ones? Just what was that kind of how did you figure that out? Well, first of all, I think everyone's experience was different. Uh, even within our 52 uh, person travel party. Everyone's experience was different because our responsibilities were different. So our realities were different. Our personalities are different. Uh, I think it was probably the most challenging for the coaches because uh, it was very hard for them to get away from coaching in the playoffs is so demanding. It's almost 24 hours a day already, just in terms of all the things you need to do and how quickly the games come at you. Uh, and usually you get a couple hours a day to kind of escape and there was no escaping, <laughs> especially once we got to Edmonton, uh, where we were a little more secluded than in Toronto. Uh, I think, uh, not that they've mentioned it to me, but putting myself in their shoes, I thought they had the, uh, probably the hardest, uh, the hardest run at it from a being confined in, inside the bubble. Um, I think the for the players again it depends on your personality it depends on what your role was kudos to the guys that that for the most part didn't play as many games and had to practice all those days and, and keep their conditioning up and we saw why it's so important because up to the last game uh, alex volkov shows up plays a big part in us winning that game he hadn't played a single game yet but practiced his butt off every day stayed on top of his conditioning kept himself ready came in and, and helped us win a Stanley Cup, and now he gets his name etched on it forever. Uh, kudos to the guys who didn't play a lot of games because it was probably hardest on them. Uh, with regards to the other guys, again, it depends on your personality, but come playoff time, you don't have that much downtime anyway. You're practicing uh, or you, you get ready for a game, you play the game, you recover from that game, you play a game. You recover from that game, you play a game. There's not a lot of downtime, uh, but for the guys who didn't play as much, it was certainly tougher. Um, when we had that stretch of five or six days off, it was probably really beneficial for our players' bodies that they got a chance to recover, uh, but you didn't want to do that for too long because that's when you actually have some, some downtime and it can get repetitive really quickly. I think for the people like myself who are in management, we had it the easiest. Uh, actually, I can't say that we, none of us in our, when we, there was four of us in our management group, I was there with uh, Jamie Pusher, Matthew Darsh and Stacey Roos. And we were kind of a team of four. Uh, and we went to over 75 games. It was set up perfectly for us. It was so convenient, especially early on. We could get three games a day. We're in a nice suite with a good view on the ice. Uh, food was good. Uh, we got to see a lot of the same teams play a mul you know, multiple times. So there's 11 teams that we saw play live at least four times each. It gives you a, an opportunity to get a better read on that particular team, their needs, their strengths, their weaknesses, things they may need to address, uh, get a good evaluation on their players. Some teams, obviously, we saw more than four times. Uh, and, and because the four of us were inside the bubble, we got to – brainstorm a lot about our organization, what we need to do for the future, what we've done in the past that may have worked and might not have worked, what every one of those other organizations, how they got to be a playoff team, what worked for them, what didn't work for them, what they need to do going forward, how they might match up with us in terms of helping each other out going forward uh, with trades and the likes. Uh, it, it, it was a really productive experience for us in management. Uh, our schedule was busy enough uh, with work 
to keep kind of keep our minds uh, sane. And then we had just enough downtime to also have some leisure, especially once we got to Edmonton, there were fewer games to scout. Uh, then we had, we had more time to honestly, to play pickleball and tennis and keep ourselves, uh, keep ourselves mentally and physically fit. Julian, we'll go to Brian Burns. Julian, I wanted to ask, go back to, to Zach Bogosian and the decision to pick him up. And I'm wondering, when you got him at the trade deadline, you had kind of longer-term injuries to McDonough and Ruda. There might have even been a, a minor injury to someone else on the blue line. I can't recall at that time. But if you don't have those longer-term injuries to McDonough and Ruda, are you looking to pick up a Zach Bogosian at that point? Was it more a case of you, you needed somebody at that time just to kind of fill in and it turned out to be a benefit to you in the long run? It's certainly – picking up Zach Bogosian certainly ended up being – uh, a key decision, I think, in our success uh, because he was an important player for us on the ice. Uh, to answer your question, candidly, I don't know because by the time Zach Bogosian became available, we'd already had those injuries. So we'd already started looking at, okay, how could we address a potential need there? Uh, not knowing, you always have a timeline, an expectation of when a player will be back. Uh, but as we saw with Steven Stamko, sometimes it takes longer than expected. Uh, so in order to make sure that we were covered there, we'd already started looking at options. So if everyone had been healthy uh, and Zach Bogosian had become an unrestricted free agent all of a sudden, would the fact that he didn't cost any assets would have been sufficient for us to go out and make the decision to bring him in? I don't know. I, I didn't live like it didn't play out. It didn't play itself out that way. Uh, maybe because again, there's very little, there was no acquisition costs. So that certainly makes it appealing. You're, you're bringing in an NHL player with significant, uh, experience. Who's got some size and some skill and who can say, uh, who can skate, like he's a good player. Um, so that could have been appealing at the same time. Do you want to rock the boat? Uh, you already have a good thing going. Your deep pairs are well matched and you've got some good chemistry and you're already considering bringing in two forwards you have to integrate all these new players and the more new players you have, the longer it might take to integrate everyone. So I don't know because again, it didn't play itself out that way. By the time Zach became available, we were already looking for someone and he was the best option. Want to go Jay Retcher? Julian, I wanted to ask you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit before when you were talking about Sorelli and Chernak and Sergachev, but I just wanted to ask you, were there any other players that kind of took that next step in your mind or maybe somebody else that kind of caught your eye over the year, whether their impact was either on the ice or off the ice? Uh, well, I think the player that was most improved this year was Mikhail Sergachev. Uh, he really turned a corner – you never know, but uh, mid-December, I think he was starting to turn the corner. And then I believe that game was on December 31st. We played in Buffalo and he just played a monster game. He got into a fight with Jake McCabe and he was just a physical presence. And then I think the next game may have been the, the game against Montreal where he kind of ended up, uh, he ended up tangled with uh, Shea Weber, who is a mountain of a man uh, and held his own there too. Uh, and I think that, that, that physicality that he started to show uh, allowed him to play with even more confidence and becoming a more effective, uh, shutdown defender. Uh, and then the coaches started giving him more penalty kill opportunities because of that. And he did a great job blocking shots and he really progressed. So he's probably our most improved player. Uh, you're looking, I think part of your question, Jay, was also who, uh, who impressed me or maybe who exceeded expectations. Uh, Kevin Shattenkirk was an incredible leader for us. He's his contribution. He, both Kevin and Pat Maroon, who we signed uh, with, with them bringing some leadership to our group in mind, they still both managed to exceed my expectations in terms of how much they brought to our locker room, how much they brought to our team, uh, both on and off the ice. Um, so not that my expectations were low, they just, they still found a way to, to manage to exceed my expectations. They were key contributors to, to our team 
uh, and they may have been exactly what we needed. So um, it's nice when things work out. We'll go to two more, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, Julian, I'm impressed that you remember the timeline specifically because I'm not even sure what date today is. Um, I'm not sure what the date is. <laughs> I have a recollection of the past. Um, ju just a quick two-part question. Uh, I know there's specific circumstances for guys who get their name on the cup. Will you be able to sort of make sure that maybe all 28 guys that, that were there with you in the bubble are able to get that to happen? And then second of all, is it in some ways like this is the shortest um, gap between the end of the cup and having to deal with the off season? Like how much time do you get to actually enjoy it and appreciate it from your standpoint? Um, to answer your first question, I have not had time to look into any of that. I've kind of delegated that to others because as you mentioned, I have a very short off season and I have other priorities and someone else can take care of that. My early understanding is that, uh, at least 27 of the players that were there uh, qualify under the current uh, standards to get their names etched on the cup. Uh, we're still looking into the 28. Uh, and I also want to mention the contribution of the four players that came in for phase two that didn't go uh, with us to, uh, to Toronto. Uh, Alex Bariboulet, Luke Witkowski, Jamel Smith, and Spencer Martin. They all helped us get ready for, for those playoffs, and we will make sure to acknowledge their contribution as well. Too much, uh, oh, and I think you had it. Yeah, and your second question, Eric, sorry, was uh, the short turnaround. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I met with Jeff Vinnick this morning. He asked me the same question, and I said, I don't, I don't know if this is actually the shortest turnaround ever. I, I'm not sure that's true. It's always short. But I know that in 2015, when we went to Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Finals, I had the same turnaround, but I didn't win the cup. This is way better. Uh, we'll go to Joe and then Diana, and then we'll uh, close in. Hey, Julian, a couple quick ones too. Do you anticipate using uh, a buyout option? And with the, um, how do you typically approach when you make deals with no trade clauses? Do you keep them in the loop in the process or do they, that's the final thing to deal with is talking to them afterwards? To answer your first question, no, I don't expect us to uh, be buying out anyone. We're in a good situation in the sense that from, from managing the cap efficiently, we don't have any buyouts on the books uh, going forward. We don't have any uh, performance bonus overages going forward. Uh, we don't have any contracts that we're going to have to bury in the minors and still take a cap hit on going forward. Uh, and all the contracts that we have, I think are all good to excellent. Like these are good players uh, and they're under good contracts. So I don't expect that. I don't expect the need to buy anyone out uh, to, uh, to get out of the cap hit. I think every single one of those guys, there will be a market for them. As to your second question, with regards to keeping guys in the loop, obviously there's ongoing dialogue or there will be. Um, I think it's important for everyone to get a chance to properly celebrate this championship. Um, as a team, we're with their teammates. I wish I didn't have to have the types of conversations I'm going to have to have as soon as I will, but it's just the reality of our business. Ultimately, it's in their best interest too. The, the sooner they know, the better for them as well. So. We'll wrap things up with uh, Diane Neeros. Just something you said about, um, or what you said about Schottenkirk and his leadership kind of sparked this, but how do you assess looking, you know, what leadership somebody can bring into the group as you're acquiring new players? It's one of those things that like, I'm sure you talk to people within other organizations, but you know, that's such a, 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 a amorphous concept you know, doesn't directly relate the way that an on ice skill does. Um, I think your question is how do you gauge a player's leadership or personality prior to getting to know them personally? Yeah. And uh, how they fit in your group. Yeah. Well, it's not an exact science. It's not a science at all. Um, it, but we, I've kind of always had this rule where I need three references before we bring someone in. Uh, and over time, you kind of build a network of of reliable people uh, that can help you get that type of information. Um, 
and again, obviously we made, we made, we made the decision to sign Kevin and Pat Maroon and, and Luke Shen and uh, all the players we've brought in based on the fact that we thought they would fit in nicely. Uh, the nice part for us is that they all exceeded expectations. And um, again, we can't, can't overstate the contribution of those guys in terms of the leadership they brought to our group. All right, Julian, thank you for your time, unless anybody has any further questions. Thank you, Julian. Thank you, Julian. My pleasure. Thank you, thank you everyone. Have a thank good you. one. You too. Thank you. Everyone Thanks, Breezer. Joining us. Thanks, Breeze. Yep. Thanks, guys. Safe travels, Joe. Thank you.